let's talk about mainstream Western culture. Um, do, do we think it's time to move on from alcohol? You know, we've become secular, supposedly. Is it time to leave our, our roots in, in wine and move on to better pastures? Well, of course it is. I mean, you know, we, you know, <laughs> I mean, and the, we kind of thought we were there in the 60s, but, um, but there was the thing called a backlash. And of course, and that, again, it, you know, the war on drugs. The war on drugs wasn't a war on drugs. It was a war on people who voted against the Republicans and who might have taken drugs. They couldn't ban voting unlike in Russia, where they can now, but, but they, in those days, you know, they had to find something to ban to sort of vilify the people who were against the war in Vietnam, etc. So, so drugs and, and, and people who use drugs other than alcohol are, are very often less interested in voting than, than people who don't. So, you know, they're an easy target because, if, you know, they, they, uh, they're easy to hate and easy to punish. You can put them in prison and they don't vote anyway, so they're not going to change the rules. So, so yeah, so, you know, we, we have to look at the last 50 years history really it all started to go wrong when the americans made alcohol legal again in 1933 after prohibition you know and and, and it's a very it was a seminal moment in the whole kind of philosophy of what to do about drugs because for two reasons the first is that alcohol prohibition had kind of failed at one level. It, it had obviously failed because uh, in terms of economically it failed, it had failed because of the, the rise of the organized crime in the mafia. It, it was actually a success at another level. It, it, it was a success intellectually because it, it proved that prohibition didn't work, but no one learned that lesson because <laughs> we carried on then prohibiting other things and discovering that they didn't work either. But, but as, soon as, as soon as alcohol was made legal in the States, the, this huge army, the untouchables, the 35,000 feds who were protecting America from alcohol were unemployed or facing unemployment. So they were, the, uh, the guy that was running them, Harry Anslinger, was confronted with a challenge. How does he keep his job? You know, and how does he keep, keep these other people, these other, his men employed? And uh, so he invented another problem and he, it was cannabis, but no one cared about cannabis. So he renamed it marijuana and he blamed Mexicans, and that's a really great combination. You've got foreigners and a new drug. Wow, that's something we can all hate. And, be, and the whole process then of kind of ban drugs and exterminate drugs has just continued and been propagated in cycles to the present day. I mean, Anna, what do you think? Is it time to move on from alcohol? No? I don't think it's, that's exactly the right question. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, it's absolutely time to move on from mass produced, industrially processed, soulless alcohol, absolutely. But I don't necessarily think we have to throw out the wine with the, <laughs> with the baby, with the bathwater, and Alcoholic close baby. down all the you know, family run <laughs> vineyards or, or anything like that. I think the real question uh, should be, is it time to move on from that unconscious party culture? Mm. The problem with alcohol is it's a very fine line between you know, that alcohol that makes you maybe more conscious and um, you know, for some people a better novelist or a better writer to that tipping point where you're unconscious and sometimes literally unconscious and passed out. And then anyone can violate you in any way they please. We need to like stop teaching our children that that's fun, that that's a good night out. We need to recreate and socialize in positive, uplifting ways, move to a more conscious way of socializing and recreating and partying instead of the unconscious model. I mean, of course, it goes without saying that different cultures consume alcohol, even in Western Europe, very, very differently from each other. You know, the French are, of course, raised to have a small glass from a very young age and whatnot. But I'm curious as to what you think, Joanna, about sort of the role of, um, say, literature in that sort of aspect of how we culturally talk about alcohol and alcohol consumption and you know the drunken writer and the alcohol yes, you know, the depressed yes. alcoholic all that kind of thing what yeah you... yeah it's so interesting i was just thinking as anna was speaking of there's i think it's an old ben elton sketch about a great night out drunk you know we could not walk we could not talk and you sort of think well really was that a great night so obviously you know i think paracelsus said about you know the, the dose is the poison you know that it's it's very much a kind of question of dosing but yes in terms of i guess it literally so if you if you see everything through the narrow lens of literature as i keep i clearly i keep doing but i was thinking in terms of knowing that prohibition didn't work as again as a reader because all the novelists are obsessed with alcohol you know during that period and you keep wondering why on earth would the absolute quintessential sort of 
Bible really being The Great Gatsby, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, which was published in 1925 at the height. And that sort of culture, which for him was incredibly damaging. And he ended up writing one of the best crack-up stories actually called The Crack-Up, which is about just, well, when the drugs don't work type thing, when it all kind of falls apart. And I guess in terms of the drinking culture, you know, there is a big kind of macho male sort of thing going on with, you know, the sort of writers, the kind of great drunken writers that it's okay for the men, you know, like Hemingway was really great because he can, you know, down sort of, well, the entire supply of alcohol, you know, before breakfast and then write. But, you know, the kind of, I think the history of female writers who enjoy the odd tipple is much less, you know, kind of adulatory. So there is this quite interesting, again, sort of cultural assumptions within it. Yes. What is it I was going to say as well, in terms of moving on, I mean, I guess lots of cultures have moved on. Islamic culture in the early medieval period moves on. You know, the Ayurvedic tradition of meditation, fasting, you know, that goes to something else. So there are, of course, you're asking about Western culture, so that, that's absolutely yeah. right. But there, there are lots and lots of other cultures where other forms of trying to be in the present moment or to explore kind of recreation, you know, don't involve alcohol. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, the, the last sort of theme was meant to be about, you know, what, what happens in the, in the future? What, how do we, how, let's reimagine this. What, what, are, what intoxicants will we use? Um, what, what would yours be of choice, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I'm drinking one now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the, one of the, this is called Sentia, by the way. This is a botanical alternative to alcohol, which uh, I've invented. Uh, which is, uh, you can get the last few bottles in the uh, centre of bar up there. I mean, what's remarkable about alcohol is it hasn't changed in, well, it has never changed, it's always been ethanol. So e almost every single thing in your life has changed. In fact, alcohol may be the only, alcohol and water, but even water comes with bubbles and, and it comes from different <laughs> sources. But alcohol has been unchanged in four or five, six thousand years. Why is that? And the answer is because it's cheap to produce, it's extraordinarily profitable for the industry. And so there's no impetus, and, there's, and it's economically very valuable to societies because of the taxation. I'm a doctor, I, you know, and I know there are other doctors. How many doctors in the audience? Yeah. Every day, all each of you meet someone who's been damaged, either themselves or their family damaged by alcohol. Every, you know, that's a, it's, alcohol permeates medicine. And all my life in medicine, I've been trying to deal with the problems of alcohol. And then about 15 years ago, I was working on the Government Foresight Program, looking at where, what the future could look like. Mm. And we kind of came to the realization, actually, we could replace alcohol. We know the science of alcohol now. Why don't we just make a safer alcohol? And that's what I've been trying to do. And it's actually, it's not difficult. I mean, if one guy by himself pretty much can do it, if the whole industry wanted to. And about 12 years ago, I, I got over the chief scientists. You may not know this, but all the big drinks companies, they have science departments. In fact, if I, can I digress for a second? I think you have. Biochemistry. The <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please feel free. <laughs> the, the discipline of biochemistry was invented by the drinks industry. Why? Because the Danes, Carlsberg, couldn't make as good a pilsner as the Germans. So they employed scientists to work out why they couldn't beat the Germans. And the scientists said, ah, because there's, there's an acid difference in the, in the water we're using in Denmark compared with Germany. So they worked out how to measure acid, uh, acid acidity, that's called pH. A guy called Ersted invented it. And that was d just to make better beer. So, so there's a, there are scientists in all the drinks companies. And I, I got one of them into, into Imperial, and I said, look, I could replace alcohol. And he said, yeah, that's great. We all know that. We all know that what we're doing as an industry is killing people. All the scientists have got this terrible conflict. And I said, great, well, why don't you go back and tell your boss, that, you know, we'll work together and replace alcohol. And he said, I will. And of course, he went back and he came back. He said, and the marketeers say, no, there's no money in it. <laughs> and there isn't, because alcohol is truly the cheapest way of making profit. But we, science can do it, and we've done it. And here's a botanical alternative, which we believe will reduce give some of the effects, the beneficial effects of alcohol, but it's going to be much less likely to damage your liver, your heart, your brain, and give you a hangover. So it can happen. But we, what we need is the culture to accept it and actually to, to drive it. If, we, if the same amount of money was put into replacing alcohol, which kills, has killed as many people this year as COVID, has been put into curing COVID, we'd all, none of us would be needing to drink alcohol next year. That, the problem would have been solved in the last year. 
but it hasn't and it won't be until culturally we decide that's a big ambition for us. That's fascinating. I mean, Anna, you, you know a bit more about the history of, of humans, right? So has, has there been, are there any other examples of what happens when humans suddenly decide to like change their food and drink consumptions in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about, and like oh. how that, that change happens? I know that's a really big question. <laughs> that's a huge, I mean, the, the first thing that to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.